Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 107. If you compete with other people, no one will help you. If you compete against yourself, everyone will help you. Robert Rodriguez. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Videoblocks. Now, Videoblocks is a subscription-based stock media company that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage everyone could afford. If you're looking for like extra exterior shots or things that you might want to incorporate into any of your projects, whether it be a narrative, documentary, music videos, commercials, these guys got you covered. They've got unlimited daily downloads from a library of over 115,000 HD video clips, as well as a huge selection of After Effects templates for like opening credits, uh, motion graphics titles, company logos, as well as motion backgrounds as well. It's pretty amazing. And at, on average, uh, subscribers pay less than a dollar per download in a course of a year. And the content does not get stale. They're constantly adding new content to the library every month. So it keeps it, keeps it very, very fresh and you always have something new to look forward to. And everything you download is 100% royalty free. Even if your subscription is canceled, you have unrestricted usage rights for anything you want to do, including personal projects and commercial projects, and you keep whatever you download and maintain the usage rights forever. Now, Videoblocks is offering The Tribe a yearly subscription for 99 bucks. That's 50 bucks off the usual price tag just for you guys, just for The Tribe. That's less than 10 bucks a month. So to get this deal, just head over to videoblocks.com slash hustle. That's videoblocks, V-I-D-E-O blocks.com forward slash hustle for this exclusive offer. And don't forget to go to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobooks from Audible. Well, guys, before we get into today's awesome episode, uh, I have a treat for you guys. Tomorrow, if you guys are following me on social media, you know tomorrow, uh, today is Monday, October 17th. Tomorrow the 18th is when we officially release the uh, trailer for This Is Meg. That's right. I have been painstakingly in the kitchen cooking up this trailer for you guys, and uh, I'm releasing it tomorrow. But because you guys are awesome, and because you guys are faithful Indie Film, tri- Indie Film Hustle Tribe members, you get a, pre- a sneak preview of the trailer before anybody else does. And all you've got to do is go over to thisismeg.com. That's right. And I've also created a new website for thisismeg.com. It is not the Seed and Spark page anymore. I've created a full-blown website dedicated specifically for This Is Meg, and we'll be adding more things coming up. But the trailer lives there. So please uh, head over and check it out. Obviously, listen to this podcast first, but head over there and check it out. Let me know what you guys think. This is a long time coming, and uh, I just, again, want to thank you guys all for being so supportive of of this project and what uh, what I'm trying to do, and I'm super excited to take you guys on the journey with me and see where This Is Meg is going to go. You know, I have no idea, but uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. I got a feature film in the can. I told you guys at the beginning of the year I was going to have a feature film done, and I had no idea how I was going to do it or what it was going to be about, but here you go. And that's just a lesson, you guys. You just have to kind of just put it, put it out there, and things will happen, you know, and, and you have to uh, work really hard. And, and uh, Robert Rodriguez said really wonderfully in, in a lecture he gave once that if you just sit there, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen at all if you just sit there and think about it or give yourself excuses why you're not making a movie. But if you just start working, start creating some momentum, some energy, the universe conspires to help you. And it's so, so true. I sat on my ass giving excuses for a better part of 20 years going, oh, it's not this. I need this camera. I need this cast. I need this script. I need this, 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 this. And I just said, screw it. I'm going to do it. 
And I did it. And the second I decided to start moving towards that goal, the universe and all these wonderful gifts, all these wonderful actors, locations, people, everything just started coming to us. And that that journey ain't over yet. There's a lot more stuff coming. And same thing happened with Indie Film Hustle. I just decided to start doing it. And so many amazing things have happened to me because of Indie Film Hustle. So that's a lesson we should all learn, guys. Is you just got to get up and do. As Nike says, just do it. All right? So today, let's get to today's episode. Oh, and by the way, please let me know what you guys think. Post it up on uh, your... Please share it. Post it up on your social media. Do whatever you want. Please just get it out there as to many people as you can. Uh, and I'll let you know in the next coming months where it's going to screen, where we're going to have our world premiere. We'll see what festivals we get into. And uh, we'll see what happens. So it could be as soon as January or it could be as soon as next summer. I have no idea. It all depends on the festivals and how they treat us and how they show us some love. So we'll see. We'll see how it all goes, guys. So today's episode, guys, is a special one because I have on the show today Egon Stefan Jr. Now, Egon is a, a long, it's old, old, old friend of mine. He's a cinematographer and pretty much a legend down in uh, the South Florida, Miami area. Grew up in the business. He's a cinematographer and also owns the only now uh, camera rental house down in Miami. And they got started uh, in the 50s, back with shows like Flipper and Sea Hunt uh, back in the days. And uh, and Egon and I have shot some stuff together. He was my DP on uh, a film called Sin that I did, uh, which of course you guys can go see at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Amazon. <laughs> for free on Amazon Prime. Um, you know, I'm always promoting, guys. Sorry. But anyway, so uh, Egon, I wanted to bring him on the show to talk about film. And I know you're going, Alex, what the hell are you talking about? Film? Like, film's dead. You ju- you just shot a movie and it's not on film. I'm like, well, yeah, it, it, it's true. I did shoot, just shot my movie without a film. Uh, I shot it on a, a Black Magic, on a digital. But you know what, guys? Film is still a format that should be protected. And believe it or not, when I started doing research for not only this uh, this podcast, but the thing I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, I was shocked at how many movies and television shows are still shot on film. And not only just by like some nostalgic people, but people who really want to shoot film. And there's a lack of knowledge and a lack of information about the actual filmmaking process, actually what film is, working with film, preparing film, what cameras to use, how to thread a mag, how to open it, you know, how to how to do it, do all that unloading and loading of a mag in a tent, in a bag, how to prep it for a film lab, how what lenses to use, what kind of lens to use, uh, what kind of camera to use. Do you use an SR2? Do you need Genlock? Do you need Crystal Sync? All this massive amount of information about shooting actual film is being lost. And it's not uh, information that you can really find anywhere. I have not yet to find an online course anywhere in the world that teaches you about shooting Super 16 millimeter or shooting film in general. It's always very, very expensive workshop somewhere. And I decided, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to shoot a course on how to shoot Super 16 millimeter properly, how to work with film, what film is, the basics of film, the basics of Uh, camera, real world like production stuff, how to get things ready to go into battle, what to do, the whole ball of wax. And we created, uh, I went down to Miami and shot um, with Egon uh, a course called the Definitive Masterclass on Shooting Super 16 Millimeter Film. Now we chose Super 16 Millimeter as opposed to 35 Millimeter because Super 16 is where the independent filmmaker will probably go. It's what they can afford and what makes the most sense. And believe it or not, shows like Walking Dead are shot on Super 16 millimeter, and we go into a lot of detail about why Super 16 is so awesome, uh, as far as looks are concerned, and what you can get out of it, and the quality that you can get out of it. Uh, right now, you can get film from Kodak and Kodak only, to my knowledge. Uh, we talk about the different film stocks, what you can get, all that kind of stuff in this course. But I wanted to bring Egon on to talk about this in some detail and give away some major knowledge bombs on shooting Super 16, and that it is a viable option for a lot of independent filmmakers because I know a lot of times being in post so long, a lot of filmmakers will come in with their DSLRs or 
or their digital footage or a Red or an Alexa, and they're like, man, I really want to make it. Can you give it more of a filmic look? Can you go back to a film? Can you throw a film fe- filter on it? Can you throw some grain on it or something like that to emulate film? Well, if you shoot film, guys, you get that look already. So it's pretty remarkable <laughs> that you could just shoot film and get it. And it's a completely different workflow um, from digital, obviously. It's a whole other language. And, you know, Egon and I were sitting down one day. And we're like, you know, this is a shame that nobody's talking about this. And Egon's been in the business for pretty much for like almost 40 years since he was a kid. Um, and he has so much knowledge. I'm like, Egon, let me just fly down there and let's just shoot this so we can give it out to the world and at least have a place where this information will stay relevant and and give this information to people who want to shoot film because there's just no information anywhere about it and it is a viable option and it will automatically add a tremendous amount of value to your movie because you shot it on film as opposed to shooting it on a dslr or shooting it on a digital format or something like that so there's a lot of wonderful things about digital uh and it is the future don't get me wrong i don't think that film is going to take over again digital is the future but film should not be forgotten and it should still be allowed to be a viable uh, fl- format in future filmmaking. So J.J. Abrams with Star Wars, all of Chris Nolan stuff, Martin Scorsese, Spielberg, um, and even newer generation filmmakers like Sean Baker, who won um, Sundance with Tangerine. Uh, I was just speaking to him the other day, and his new movie is shot on 35 millimeter. Um, and I was like, wow, you, you, you're the one that brought the iPhone into the to mainstream about shooting films with the iPhone. He's like, yeah, and I love the iPhone. I think it was great for that movie. But this movie called for a different look, and I want to shoot film. And I think film is something that should not be forgotten and lost. And that is one of the reasons why I not only put this podcast together, but I put this entire course together. And at the end of this course, I'm going to give you a special coupon uh, to get a discount on the course. And it is a little bit more pricey than my normal courses because, guys, it was a lot of work. And I, when you see it, you'll understand. And we are, we are going to be putting up uh, some free samples of the course up on YouTube so you can kind of take a look at it. Uh, and it'll be also on the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 107. So I'll put a couple, of, uh, a couple of the lessons up so you can kind of see the quality of what we shot. And ironically, we shot the whole course on a digital platform, <laughs> but that just makes sense. But anyway, guys, so um, Egon is is a, just an encyclopedic amount of information about filmmaking, and he's worked with insane directors like Ridley Scott, Tony Scott, Michael Bay, Joe Pitka, uh, and a ton, I mean, just amazing amount of people that he's worked with over the years and worked with some amazing DPs like Paul Cameron, who's shooting Westworld right now and shot the Matrix movies, among other ones. I mean, there's just a, a, the list. I was just shocked at his resume when I actually looked at it. It was pretty, pretty insane. So if you guys are even remotely interested in filmmaking and actually putting the word film back into filmmaking, uh, then enjoy my conversation with Egon Stefan Jr. I would like to welcome to the show Egon Stefan Jr., the legendary Egon Stefan Jr. How are you doing, sir? Oh, Alex, it's great to see you and great, great to be here with you. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. So, guys, I don't know if you know this. Me and Egon go back better part of a decade now. <laughs> Egons. We've gone back Egons. Egons, exactly. <laughs> and if you guys have uh, checked out any of our uh, courses we've done together, the Red Course and the uh, DSLR course, uh, you'll already know who Egon is. But Egon is a legend down in the, the Miami area. His uh, father... Um, started uh, Cinema Video Tech, uh, and why am I why am I explaining this? You should explain it a little bit. How did you get into this crazy business? How did I get into this crazy business? Let's see. Okay, so if I if I think if my father was a police officer, I'd I'd have followed in his footsteps or a, a fireman. But he came over from Germany and the and the right when the war broke out and uh, got relocated and stationed down in Miami. And opened up a company at that time called Cinetech, which is in 1968. And there wasn't really anything happening. It was like swampland down here. It was like a really weird place for motion pictures. But then actually different horror films came in, like The Creature from the Black Lagoon and a TV series called Flipper and Gentle Ben and Sea Hunt. And these shows were featuring Florida and Miami. And my father was at the right place at the right time. And then he would just uh, repair cameras and then 
before you know it, invest into more equipment and then start being the supplier for a little bit of everything. I mean, with lights, cameras, lenses, and then helicopter mounts. He was a good friend of Nelson Tyler from making uh, the Tyler uh, camera system mounts, and we became a dealer. And then uh, shortly after that, many years, then we became a Panavision dealer. And for like 15 years, we were a Panavision rep down here. And then uh, it seems like at least most of the jobs that would come down to South Florida, my father would have something to do with it, or we'd have something to do with it. We'd either work on the crew, or we would supply the equipment, or do both. Now you you've been you know because you've been basically on the front lines of every major production that went down in Miami over the last uh, few decades. <laughs> you uh, you kind of came up. Uh, you know you worked on Vice. Uh, you worked on Bad Boys. You worked with some legendary directors. Uh, I know you told me a couple stories of Ridley and Tony Scott when you worked with them in the commercial world. Can you uh, can you share some of those uh, stories? Well, when I was in uh, my my junior year of high school, uh, my fa- I was I had the urge. I was working at um, when I'd get home from school, I would go over to my dad's company and and just kind of you know wander around and. I was wandering around his company since I was a little kid. There's pictures of me, you know, like playing with the with the drill press and the shavings of the lathe machine. And so it was like my playground. You know, I didn't really understand what I was around at the time because it just seemed like a lot of stuff. And a long time, I, I thought my dad was just a truck driver because he had a lot of vehicles and you take me everywhere. <laughs> he'd drop off these trucks. I didn't really understand fully till what it was happening. So when um, when I was younger like that, my father... Uh, wanted me to get on some of these shows because, you know, to give me a taste of being in the field, not just being in a shop. And I didn't have a union card. And that was a big deal. I mean, at that time, you know, unions and we had the the IATSC out of, out of Chicago. And at that time, it was uh, local 666, <laughs> the demon. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but it's uh, you couldn't get on a union show unless unless you were union. So they also had a restriction on what age you were to come in the union. You couldn't just get in there at 16 years old. And that's kind of like what, what my age was. Mm -hmm. But, uh, they pulled some strings and, uh, got me to at least be able to take the test. And then that time it was a written test and a, and a, and a actual hands-on test. But since I worked at the rental house, I was the one setting up all the equipment and it was like, I already knew the names of everything and how to put it together, but I didn't know the practical application of these tools. I only knew like, this is, what this goes and the names and the pieces of it, but to use it in the field, that was all new stuff that had to be learned. So they, uh, I was sponsored actually from, um, Steve Poster, who is now the, you know, he's, he's, he's a legend himself and he was doing some jobs down here. And the first jobs I ever worked on was spring break and, uh, (laughs) And, um, it was ironic because, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid and I just walk out on the set and it was like from being in a shop, it was like a whole new world. I mean, there were so many people and there was people doing this and that, and they all had a routine. They were all like little worker bees. And I'm like, Whoa, I got a lot to learn. So I was like the cam, I was doing slate, you know, I was, and the time we were doing all film. So it was like, I, I started doing this slate and running magazine cases back and forth to set on these different little jobs I was doing. And then they finally said, well, why don't you load mags? And I was like, okay, good. So I got that down and became a second assistant and loaded mags for many, many years on many, many shows. I mean, I did, I, I loaded mags on Parenthood mm-hmm. and with, uh, with Ron Howard, and Ron, Howard's Orlando, movie. Yeah, Ron, Howard's Ron Howard's movie. Ron Howard's movie. Yeah. And you know, every, every day having lunch with Ron and his family, it's really, really, really great experience. Cause I learned a lot. How was, yeah. How was Ron to work with? I hear he's just the nicest man in the world. He's so nice. There's no stress on the set that you would normally have on, on other jobs. I mean, he, he's very thorough. I mean, the guy's, you know, he's, he's, he's a legend. talking about a master. He's a legend. I mean, he, it's like he does it. He does it the right way. He does it perfect. And he surrounds himself with all the most talented people and they all have the same type of demeanor. So you, you actually get a lot of things, a lot of good things done, a lot of good moments and the actors love it. And it was a really nice experience because what what it provided me an opportunity of working in this business is when you never know what the phone call is going to be for. And it, when you're a camera assistant, you always they always need a camera assistant, you know, whether it's a loader or a first assistant on any job. So, the, you know, you'd get a phone call and say, you, are you available for these days? And I'm like, uh, 
sure, let me make sure I can get out of school or if my dad will let me go. And when is it, when's the, when's the call time? And they would say at all night. So it was like, wow, it was the introduction to you guys going to shoot until the sun comes up. And that wasn't what I was used to either. It was like, this is all, is all a learning curve, but I got to meet fantastic people. And especially at some point in their career that they were just normal people, you know, they were just, uh, they were the, they were just blossoming that today they're, ASC cameramen, their DGA directors, their their uh, owners of different companies, and you remember when they walked in the door of my dad's company to just want to learn the business and work as like a I don't know sweeping the floor or you know give me a job. They work in prep tech or let me let me do something like that. That later on, many many years later, they are somebody that is really big or that I would get the chance of uh, working with somebody that. I admired for many, many years. And it was like, wow, what an opportunity. I wouldn't, I would, I would work it even if I didn't get paid. You know what I mean? It was like that kind of thing. So like, so how was the stores working with Ridley and Tony? Oh, and there are, there are masters. I mean, we were doing commercials. I mean, we were doing commercials and, and that kind of thing. And it, it was fashion also along with it. Mm -hmm. So they were meticulous and they're very creative. I mean, they're, it's some, it's something that I would love to one day be at their level because they, you know, they, they figure everything out and then have plans and alternate plans and alternate changes. And Mm -hmm. they know technically, because a lot of times when you're a camera assistant, you work with a crew and you work with somebody, they might not know the system very well, but they still know how to be there at the job that they, they want to be and they want to do. And you rarely find somebody that knows your job <laughs> and then right. actually can and actually can do your job better than you sometimes and you're like wow i didn't even know that because one time i had you know i worked a lot with burt reynolds and because he had a place up here in jupiter and still does and and he was you know he was still doing commercials and little movies and things like that and and uh, we got to be actually you know speaking terms and friends and and one time I was on the top of a 18 wheeler doing one of his movies and uh, my assistant, I was the first and my second assistant wasn't up on the top of the truck to do the slate because we're, again, we're doing film and sound and all that kind of stuff. And Bert goes to grab my slate because I had the slate there and I'm like, no, 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 Bert. And he's like, look, kid, I know what I'm doing. And he gives, he says, where's, where's the mouse? And he even knew the name of it, which is mm-hmm. the thing we call for writing the the, mm-hmm. the marker on the slate with the little puffy thing on the back. And he goes, what's what's the scene uh, number? And I give it to him. He does it all there. He puts it up perfectly where it's supposed to be, mm-hmm. says it like you were as an assistant saying one one, take one, a camera marker and hit it and hand it back to me. And I was like, holy shit, I just thought you were an actor. <laughs> well, it's Bert. I mean, he's, you know, they understand Burt Reynolds was the biggest movie star in the world for many years. So I'm sure mm. he's done a couple of things. I'm sure if you give Tom Cruise a, a slate, he might know what to say too. Well, over the years, I developed a relationship with him that he always recognized and remembered me. So mm. he'd come over and talk to me and he knew my dad, which mm. is cool. And we would just talk about cars and other things or movies or things he's done. And he was always really friendly and very very open to me. And, uh, <laughs> I had a mistake on the set happen. And, you know, cause you know, as a first assistant, when you finally get to that level, when you're working up the ladder of camera department, cause I did it the slow way. These days people don't do that. They don't go and be a, a, a trainee, then a clapper loader, then a second, then a first, then an operator, then a second unit DP. And then finally calling yourself a DP. It takes years, 20 years to climb up that long ladder and get to that place that you could actually, it's not just you say, I'm this position. The people around you have to respect and understand that you can do that job and then they give you a call because I can call myself a director and they won't, they won't hire me because so, but, I don't have anything around. But so then you mean you, you can't just buy a red camera and you're not an automatic DP because you bought a red camera? These days you can, yes. <laughs> in my day, in my day, when you were in a certain part of camera department, you had things you can and can't do. Some some things was you will not ever load a, the second assistant will not put the magazine on the camera and thread it. Right. They will hand you the magazine, but they won't. They won't. They won't do that part unless unless you felt – and it was a, you know, a circumstance that you had to and you knew they could do it because when you're putting up – when you're threading up a camera with real film, 
if you get nervous, if you mess up, you can tear that perf. And then that delay it while everybody's waiting for you to say camera's ready, you could mess it up and then, you know, be really stupid. So it's a lot of pressure at that little moment of reload. So that hence, hence I wanted to say the story was, so I'm, I've been working with Bert for many jobs and now I'm on one of these jobs and was, I think it was the maddening, uh, or the man from left field. It was one of his movies he was directing and being in it. It was about kids and baseball and stuff. And, um, there was a scene that required a sort of like a little fight scene. And then Bert was, he's really good at stunts and he knows the routine. He's a tough guy and he's like, hell, I can do anything, you know, and he's done right. everything. So he was going to do this controlled fall down these bleachers. And he, Ooh. you know, he went in, he went into the, he went into the, the, you know, wardrobe and got his, you know, all, you saw his pads that he's used for like, I don't know, 30 years. And he put his knee pads on his elbow pads and he, and he had a little ectoskeleton protection underneath his, his clothing. So right before all that happened, the camera that I was working on, we were using a steady cam and it was a film camera. So unbeknownst to me, my second assistant came over and uh, had a magazine to put onto the steady cam. And I said, no, no, just put it off to the side and I'll, I'll thread it. But instead of putting it off the side, he put it on the camera. So I'm not going to bitch about that. It was like, okay, it's on. So I, I, I assume that it's threaded, you know, and it's on the camera because mm -hmm. you would never put a bag and not thread it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So of course the sun's dropping down and we've got this magic hour moment to do this stunt with, with Bert doing it himself and falling down these bleachers oh, on magic so, hour too, nonetheless at magic hour. Exactly. So oh. we got, we got three cameras. It's all a Panavision job, you know? So we got the Panama, the, the Panaflex. Uh, I think we had a, a, a platinum and we had the 400 foot mag on the back. So of course we go from regular, uh, studio mode on sticks that we're doing these shots to, okay, city cam and we're strapping it up. I'm, I'm putting the, the, the pressed in and getting the focus more, you know, all the, all the things and, you know, lighting it all up and the right filter combination. And we're all like rushing, rushing, rushing. Okay. We do the scene it's dialogue and he goes down and he has this, he almost, he, he actually does this emotional scene and even started to like get a little teary eyed because he was, you know, acting really well. And then he walks off and we pan off to the sunset. Beautiful cut. Great. Check mm -hmm. the gate. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I go and open up the camera. Oh no. The film is not threaded in the camera. <gasps> oh my god! So the, on the Panaflex, you have contacts on the magazines, and it, and it has a wind-up motor that's always on. Right. And when you turn it on, it, it takes up. So the film did go through to the other side, but never through the the gate to be exposed. Perfect. So we were looking at it, thinking, "Well, we're rolling." So that that scene was, uh, you know, two hundred and twelve feet or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't exposed to two hundred twelve feet. So of course, you know, when 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 Bert did the move, he banged himself a little bit, so he kind of walked off the field like you know, the limpy thing, and I had to go, <gasps> so I had to run over and and tell and tell Nick McLean, who was the who was the DP, and I said, Nick, 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 we got a real big, 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 big problem. Look, nobody go away. Look, the film, they didn't go through the camera. He's like, what? He goes, no, no, it was on it, but it didn't go through the, the and I told him, he goes, well, you better go tell Bert that. Oh, because he's like, I'm not going to go tell Bert that. You I'm not going to go there. You go tell Bert. Oh, my and God. I, but we, we don't have that scene. We don't have it at all. Right, right. He goes, well, you better hurry then. So I have Cause, yeah, because it's magic because magic hour, so lights going. Yes, yeah, so I, he's already trying to walk off the field, and we're almost like you know they were calling, okay, we're done, you know, yay, great day, you know, kind of thing, and I'm right. gonna run over and say, Mr. Reynolds, Bert, Bert, we have a really major problem, and he goes, what? And he looks at me, and he gave me that thousand yard stare. Yeah, and I said, we had a technical problem. The magazine was put on the camera, and it wasn't threaded through, so we didn't have anything exposed. What did he do? He he just stared at me for about a couple of moments without even moving his body without breathing <laughs> yeah without breathing and then since he was also directing this job it had to be i said but right now we do not have that shot at all it's we don't have it all right i'm telling you now it's not going to be in dailies it's not there we don't have it i'm telling you right now i don't know what happened but we're losing the light and i'll figure it out later and he turned away and got mad a little bit of course, of course. and and then went to go redo the scene uh-huh and yelled, okay, right back. We got to do this again. I'm like, what, what, what? And it's like, oh, my head's down. Now I'm saying to myself, shit, okay, it's wide open. We don't even have the lights out. The sun's almost gone. My focus and depth of field is now mm -hmm. really, really critical. 
and I don't want anything else to happen. So I double check even the, <laughs> the camera again after I thread it to go, is it really filming there? Please, please, is it really filming there? And I check the gate, make sure, okay, we're good, we're good. We're all this in, as fast as I could. Mm-hmm. The take, he has to fall down the thing and do the stunt again. Oh, Jesus. And he, he kind of hurt himself the first time a little bit. But I think the second time, he kind of hurt himself there again. Yeah. And then he came up to me and he ripped off his pads. And he goes, tell me you got that. Yeah. And I went, I went oh, I'm not checked. And I said, yeah, gate's good. And he goes, later on, we have to talk. <laughs> and then he, he just pulled off. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I got a, I got a major guy hating me. No, you're going to the principal's hate. office. You're going to the principal's yeah, office. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get my, I'm going to get, I'm going to get paddled and, you know, we met later on and he gave me the father to son kind of talk about, you know, responsibilities and consequences and then said, I hope you don't ever have that happen again, especially on my job. And I said, and he goes, but I do thank you for telling me before I had to find out the next day. It would have been worse. Of course, because they would have to have done the entire scene. And got the shot. It was, it was actually, I think, a little prettier because it was more golden at the time, you know? It, sure it was, Egon. Sure it was. <laughs> sure it was. But you, know, you have things like that that happen where you have a technical problem. Now, the reason why these things happen is in these days and age, you have digital cameras. You have a lot less of a learning curve to know how to play with it. You don't have the, the experience of the masters on how to create something with light and shadow and and have it to, to do it on film, but you can still get good images and people get great stuff. And I think that the the margin of major mistakes is gotten smaller. So it's easier for people to just pick up a camera and shoot with it and not have issues mm-hmm. like focus or depth or ground glass from, column. Made, column from issues. somebody for somebody oh. who just DP'd their first feature film, I can guarantee you that's the case. Because if I would have had to shoot this is Meg on film. I would, okay. I would have never done it, but because there's so much latitude with these cameras, um, yeah. uh, it's it's different now. But the main reason I brought you on the show, uh, Egon, was you talked a lot about mags and perfs and film. I wanted to talk about film, and I was specifically like 16 and super 16 millimeter film, and you know why in God's green earth are people still shooting on film in today's digital world? Can you give me an explanation? I think. That medium is like almost like you're talking about oil painting. I, I mm-hmm. kind of feel where I just saw recently a, a, a film done in film, and I'm looking at the screen and I went, What is it that I like about what I'm seeing? I can't place my finger on it, but I know it's not any of the digital camera looks that I've, I'm familiar with. It's not an Alexa, it's not a Sony something, it's not a Red. It was like, it was like I don't know. And then, of course, afterwards, is when I look more detailed and said, well, it's film, it's film. That's there's, there's something, I don't know, I guess in human nature or the way that your mind captures what you're seeing. Sometimes if you do it correctly, it gives you more of what I think your memories are like and, and more like bring you back to an emotion when you can watch something and you get that chill up the back of your spine or that, or that little goosebumps on that you get from something that happens in a moment that an actor or a scene happens. I, I think that, it achieved its moment to is it, activate for the audience. Is it something, is it just because it's an organic thing? Is it because, I mean, I've shot 35, I mean, I've shot film, a ton of film in my career, and I've also shot a ton of digital in my career. And there is something about film. Now, I'm not sure if that's nostalgia for me and you, because it's our generation, we grew up with film. Do kids who are in their teens now who really don't know the difference or didn't grow up with the film or didn't grow up with home video, home vi- not video, home films that they actually would project on the wall and things like yeah, that. Yeah, like, like Super, Super 8 and Super 8 yeah. or 16 like that. Yeah. So is yeah. it is it a nostalgic thing with our generation and beyond or is there actually something organic that will it touches you on a on a no i i do feel something something organic because when i take my kids who are like 18 years old and and younger people like in their 20s -hmm. and i'll sit them down and show something and say so what do you see here what do you what do you go oh man this looks great i love it i don't know and they and they're with a side by side comparison of something from film or from high-end digital Mm -hmm. they don't know why but they say it has a nicer something that 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 it factor, that little thing you want to put your finger on it. I don't know if it's a tonal values or the way it falls off or the mm-hmm. way it make, makes you feel like it's more like 
in like I said, in my mind of my memory some, of something. It's there's something. I, there is something. There is something really magical about film. And, and now, and, and by the way, a lot of people now are shooting more and more film than they ever have in the past, probably five to ten years, because um, a lot of people are going back to shooting well, you, uh, shooting super yeah. 16 specifically like walking dead is shot on super 16 right the movie the oscar nominated movie carol just got shot westworld's hbo's westworld shot on film there's so well, many it, okay so the dp on westworld paul cameron yeah is one of my favorite people i mean yeah, he, I, did the, I actually, he did the matrix if i'm not mistaken I, I, right well he did gone in 60 seconds swordfish uh yeah. uh deja vu um he he works with he, he works he's, with, he's a very big Big, big DP. Okay. When I met Paul, mm -hmm. Paul was a camera operator on a music video. Mm -hmm. And I was a camera assistant. And we kind of hit it off because I was I was working at that time. You know, you do like little little weird stints of just doing movies and then you do a, a music video and then get and then do like concert after concert. Cause when I was growing up, it became the eighties and you know, you're doing you're doing a couple of city tours and you're around a lot of different people and you got 15, 20, 30 cameras, super 16 cameras that would be filming concerts. You know, I did, I did, I think it was 40 or 50 cameras at, at uh, Yankee stadium for Billy Joel back in the day. And there was all film, film 16, super 16. God. Mm -hmm. And Paul was from a group that was the, the main mentor was Tony Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Tony Mitchell had, Crescenzo, had Crescenzo, Notarali, and you had uh, Romeo Taroni and you had Paul Cameron and you had Eddie Stevenson and you have Jim Gucciardo, and these guys were like this little clique that really nailed it. They were like on that, you know, giving at least concerts and music video imagery that people were really adapting to. Mm -hmm. And I got to be in the in the flight seat with them. I was their wingman. I was the the camera assistant, mm -hmm. pulling focus under them. And then if you pulled that off, they would hire you on a big commercial or a movie or something. And then when I see Paul, from even when I was just back pulling focus days. He he was from you know he he has a beautiful eye and he he knows technically I mean, like I said everything everything about your job he he's known he knows it better than you do yeah. and he'll and he knows how long something takes and he also knows how to create this imagery that you know when I've there's very few times I'm on set working with somebody that when I see what they do out of nothing and they make this lighting and the camera and everything and in the positions that I go damn, that's really, really good. I wish I'm going to remember this. So one day, if I ever get a chance, I'm going to do it kind of like that. And they were like my, as a, as a first, you learn under these people that, that have all these different experiences that you can learn from. I mean, and of course, if you don't mess up, you could do more work with them and that they're at their careers. Cause Tony and Ridley was working with, with Paul way back in the beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I kind of, I kind of, you know, I did, um, if I if I try to remember every every top guy, I mean, I worked with <laughs> I worked with Darius Wolski on uh, his first movie in the United States that I got fired off. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the first time, the first time I ever got fired off a job, and and it was uh, before he went on to do you know uh, Dark City and The Crow and the Pirates of the Caribbean's and wait a minute, the guy who did Dark the guy who did Dark City also did The Crow. Yeah. Oh my god! I didn't know that. I didn't know that it was the same DP because they both have a very unique. The Crow is gorgeous. I love the look of the Crow. Uh, well, he shot that in film. That was that was oh, that using. Was, yeah, of course. That, that that was using daylight stock at night. Well, ASA fifty stock at night. So in order to get an exposure, you have to light it like insane with big so, lights, big guns, and anything that didn't have light on it went black obviously because so, it had no latitude so that's a perfect segue can you talk a little bit about the difference of film stocks and what you can get with different film stocks so just a, a slight kind of a overview on today's film yeah stocks. it's like I, I would say like the film stocks is like the idea of lutz today i mean they, it would be that if you in the day obviously you had to go and process the film that night and then you would see it the next day you wouldn't see it right away you'd see the video assist on low res standard def 480 lines of black and white video yeah. and and hope it's going to be nice, but the the skill of working on set with Kodak film or Fuji film or Agfa at the time, and then going into the the lab and seeing the processing and seeing the everything where it goes from the moment you put it in a magazine to the time you see it on the screen, 
the the chemical process that's happening. That's another thing that I, I it's it's unique to when you said what's that thing about it is silver. It's like cooking. Yeah, it's yeah. like cooking. You know, you've got you've got you've got to strip the silver or you keep the silver or you know you beat bleach bypass or 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 any of these little effects that you would do to create a look was done with how long it stays in the bath, what chemicals you use, what, what things would enhance the different layers of the colors in the film. And then it would get stripped off and you'd have this, you know, it's like timing lights, how you, you would only know that by a lot of practice with the medium. So a guy can go out there DP and can say, all right, we're going to be out in sunny Miami. If, if we're really no clouds and super sunny, We'll use daylight, you know, ASA 50. And if you're going to get some type of overcast, you would use ASA 250 daylight. Right. And they would still blend well. But there would be some, some stocks that you wouldn't want to mix with it because the characteristics would be so vastly right. different. Which, like in today's world, it's all DI and all color grading yeah. and things like that, where before you had to do it all in the can or all in the in the lab. But today's yeah. world, though, for people listening, you can shoot film and every every person who shoots film – Color grades digitally now. I mean, everything gets transferred yes. digitally, yes. and then you can yes. do all. So a lot of you still can do some of the magic in the lab, and you could do some crazy things in the lab to do stuff to the negative, then bring it into color grading yep. and do things in color grading off of that negative that you could not achieve digitally alone. There's certain no. things that you could do, like a bleach bypass. You can kind of get close to it, but it's not going to be saving Private Ryan or using um, cross-processing or, or, yeah. or shooting reversal stock, which I used to love shooting reversal stock. If anybody's ever I seen – I love a, that. If you ever, if, has anyone ever seen a, a music video from the 90s, that's all they freaking did is shoot cross-reversal <laughs> stock and, and, they, and they jacked up the colors and stuff like that in a way that digital alone can't really achieve as well it's just a different thing and i always look at film kind of like slow cooking as opposed uh -huh. to sure fast food. As, look, you, you can get a good meal in fast food you go over to chipotle well maybe not chipotle but um no, you, Puyo tropical come on okay, throw, throw, for people please. who don't know what Puyo tropical is it's kind of like because uh, that's a miami thing but it's like a fast food but it's kind of like casual fast kind of like the like kind of like a Chipotle or something like that, but uh, with Cuban food. And so you can have a good meal, and it's tasty, and it's great, and it's more than acceptable. Uh, and in many ways, it's really, really, really good. But and it might get you fat. And it might get you fat, but depends on what you eat. But, um, <laughs> but if you slow cook the same meal, have yeah. grandma make it for you, and she uh -huh. takes her time and all that, that's what shooting film is sometimes. So it's almost like a, it's like a craft – you're being a craftsman. In a sense, um, uh, what's the artisan? That's the word. You're being almost an artisan with creating images with film. And it is a very magical thing. And it's become much more affordable nowadays um, than it used the to be. The only thing I see is that there is a, a gap now. Because back when film was film, somebody would come into my shop and say, can I intern? Or, hey, can you teach me how to load mags? Or teach me something like that. It would be a common thing. Yeah, here's something. Go work on. We'll, we'll teach you right like that. Now there's nobody around that teaches that, and that's not something that even schools are teaching that. And there are rental houses that still have film cameras that still even have all those options of knowing that you have to have 200 foot, 400 foot, mm -hmm. thousand foot, 1200 mm -hmm. foot magazines, whether they're backloaded or handheld mags or lightweight mags or city cam mags. It's like all that information is only for the people that have done it and they're getting older. I mean, I'm, I'm getting up there in some years. I mean, I'm, I'm not a spring chicken anymore, but I don't see that anybody that's from the younger generation, unless they have some type of an avenue to learn that it's going to be a lost art. There's going to be I mean, the more that somebody doesn't keep it in their place or have it available, it's going to be like a rare find and you have to go up to the mountain and talk to the wizard and know how to do that. <laughs> well, that's, I think, one of the reasons why you and I sat down and said, like, you know, when we started putting courses together, we both kind of came up with like, hey, why don't we do a, six, a super 16 millimeter course? Because not a lot of people, well, excuse me, nobody. I can't still, I still can't find anything online. There is no online course teaching really teaching um 60 super 16 millimeter how to actually shoot it the 
all the knowledge of it, every every aspect of it from someone who's actually done it. Uh, and and you're right, not even schools are teaching 16 as much anymore. I mean, you know, maybe New York Film Academy, I think, maybe still teaches some 16, but it, they kind of just skip right over it and just jump over to the Red or the Alexa or the Black Magic, and they don't spend a lot of time on it. Um, but it's something that needs to be taught, and that's why you and I kind of put that whole course together. Um, and, and Kodak has, has felt that too. They they have been doing their own little workshops that introduction to that, and their 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 events fill up a lot because some of the people coming to them are union people, and they're saying, "Well, I get a call saying, are you available for these jobs?" You say yes, and they said, "Okay, are you do know that we're shooting this in either Super 16 or 35. anamorphic or." Or, or 35. So you're good with that, right? And they're like, uh, I haven't worked with that. And they say, oh, thank you. And they hang up and they go to the next guy. Right, so they're thinking, I mean, well, I, I need to learn that. Well, I mean, perfect example. West HBO's Westworld is a monster show. Which is beautiful. I watched it and it was like amazing. I was like, I was stunned. I, I was looking at that on my 80 inch screen TV going like, whoa, I love the way this looks. Yeah. I mean, you got Westworld, you've got uh, American Horror Story still shot on Super Gotham. 16. Gotham go is shot it. on Super 16. No, 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 no. But it's a good look. Which it one? Oh, a, yeah. Oh, no, but, uh, but, but Walking Dead is shot on yeah. Super 16. There's a ton of television, specifically television, a lot of television, but also, I mean, some major. A lot of major motion pictures. Star Wars was shot on Super 16. All the Star Wars are being shot now on, on not Super 16, on uh, 35 or Super mm-hmm. 35. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, anything Christopher Nolan does is shot on 35, or if not IMAX. Um, so film is not dead. I know a lot of people think it is, but it's not. And it's still, you know, is it ever going to be the main thing anymore? No, it, it won't. No. It's not. No, it, technology no. is yeah, taking techno- over. But it should be not something that dies. I think that's the big thing. I think it should be an option for filmmakers and storytellers and image makers to have that filmmaking uh, option and actually be a film, put the film back into filmmaking, you know, which is, is something that right. people have forgotten. Right. You know, we say film or we say, oh, we're gonna, I'm going to go make that film. I'm like, no, you're going to go make a digital product you know or i'm gonna i'm a filmmaker i'm like you're not you're an image maker you're a content Mm -hmm. creator you're not a filmmaker because you're not making things with film um so that's that's that whole thing so when you what can you talk about real quick can you because i know we talk about 16 and super 16 can you tell the audience what the difference between the two are well the day there was there was regular 16 and you had perfs on both sides of the of the frame and they needed they wanted to see if they can with put more image onto that film. And in order to do that, they said, okay, if we got rid of one set of perfs, we could shift it over to the, to the, to the right. And we could actually make it so that we would have a, a 16 by nine or a two, three, five kind of feeling to it on, on 16. And they, what they did is they actually figured out on the camera, how to take the mount and flip it 180. That would bring you over just those little bit that you needed to take care of that. And then the super 16 film was only perfed on one side. Same thing happened with the regular 35 and super 35 in order to, to do that. They had to try to squeeze stuff, but they still maintained both perfs. but they were able to, to, to ad- adapt a 180 degree mount on the cameras that could shift you. And also they would also do that on the bottom of the camera for the base plate to line up all the rods and the follow focuses and the mat box, everything had to be shifted over a little bit, but, and it would give you, it would give you more landscape, more real estate to put your imagery on. Right. And it give you more of that 16 by nine look, which everybody yeah. was looking for. Cause remember the olden days obviously was four right. by three and that's what 16 was four by three. Well, if it was the old and olden days, you even had, you know, two perf tetanoscope. That was all the spaghetti Westerns and a lot of the popular, uh, movies of our past was used in that format. That was, that was more than a 16 by nine. You're looking, you're looking at an anamorphic image with spherical lenses instead of being anamorphic lenses. Got you. Got you. Got you. So, and then you'd optically change it when you would project it. Now, what would be the top three tips you would give uh, somebody going out and shooting film for the first time on location? Have somebody in your pocket that you can call for if you get in trouble. Do a lot of homework. Mm-hmm. Um, test. Take – we would – in my day, we would, you know, take a hundred foot or two hundred feet of some film, and we would test it. We would test it with lights and latitude, and mm-hmm. and different things, just like you would do now. That I think the the process of 
testing your tools or preparing them before you go out and use them has really become a little laxed. I mean, normally you'd have like two weeks to prep a show and you would be doing, you know, days of different types of tests and stuff. And now sometimes you get two days and you don't fill all that in because there's not a, there's not that, that demand to actually put it through those, those riggers and the cameras are different. They're not film cameras anymore. So I would say you'd want to have at least some hands-on experience with it, even if it's an environment that is very calm and relaxed so that you can just mess up. You know, I would say also you, know, you have to have a light meter. That's another thing that people don't, don't realize is, you know, light meters still work today. <laughs> they, they, they measure light. So, mm -hmm. and, and the sensors are doing it all automatically and that kind of thing. But still, if you're going to do that, you need to have a, a concept of, of light and how to create a look with shadow and, and not just, you know, people think if I take a light and I put it over the camera and I bang it into something, you're lit. Well, if you're doing news footage, you're lit. Yes. But if you're trying to create an emotion, a feel or something, the type of light, the color of light, the mm -hmm. unit of light, how you kind of place it and do it is the molding of the scene that you're doing. And to, to achieve that, you need a meter. So you would probably want to, you know, have some people at least that have been, who've done it once or twice <laughs> once or twice to give you a little little a little help yeah i was perfect example i was i was working on a project that was shot on super 16 and the filmmaker found somebody who said that they can do it and they sent it to me and i it, it was literally grain central like the grain was as big as boulders and yeah. and it was just shot horribly bad not not because it not because the lighting particularly was it was just the exposure wasn't right and it was just super 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 grainy so um they were like hey you know what can we do i'm like there's not a whole lot we can do man you mean these these grains are si I'm literally the size of boulders and yeah. that's the thing that people have to understand when they're shooting film it is not nearly as forgiving as digital no uh, and, but that that was also, why you you went to school and you you you, you learned, learned art it was an art thing. It wasn't just, hey, I, I go out and I shoot, you know, concerts and or or you know, weddings and that kind of. No, we're really doing this as a as an art. You're learning. You're. I mean, the the things that I would read is always trade magazines or articles about the people that I admire and I and I look up to that they're giving explanations on how they did something or calling them up and saying, hey, I just watched what you did how did you do this little scene? Because I'm amazed. I can't figure it out. And you talk to him about it and you actually, that's what you kind of did to improve on. And people would actually say to you, Hey, I want my Pepsi commercial to look like this scene of this movie from this particular team. And you'd be like, Hmm, okay. Now you have to somehow not have been, been on that last job, create that look with the experience level that you have. Or or, or, like, or try to find it in the uh, American cinematographer where the DP yeah, explains everything. You, you go right back and you go, <laughs> go like, get all those issues and say, okay, where was that? Okay, oh, you, they, okay, they used a, they used um, lightning strikes and they used yeah, oh, uh, yeah. yeah like I, I actually uh, I studied the one from um, uh, God uh, Ken, oh God uh, Condi who did uh, Seven and yes. because Seven was such a kind of revolutionary way it was shot you know with the whole silver bath and. You yeah. know, and and they just the darks went so dark, and this was at the time when digital was not around yet. Right. Uh, and I just studied it. There, I just bought. Um, I love collecting uh, Stanley Kubrick's American cinematographers, so I got The Shining, just just yep. for fun, just to see, because I was one of the first times they used Steadicam, not the first time, but one of the first times they used Steadicam. Uh, it was just it's just fun, but yeah, that's how you would do it. But it 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 can it's, film is can be forgiving if you choose the right stock and light it the proper way. So like the well, vision stocks, those Kodak vision stocks, which are basically what is left uh, now is like, it's all vision stock, if I'm not mistaken, or is, is there another other kinds of uh, Kodak stock now as well? I, I believe that that's the, the visions that are, that are the vision two and, and stuff that, but that's where the, the best of having learned over all those years of working with film and latitudes that they've got to, I mean, they, they kind of, but they didn't say at that point, but there were the exotic stocks that, that oh, that's yeah, why fun stuff that when we just... would, when, when we would do, do our job and we'd get a call, I mean, and it was especially a film job, obviously we, they, you were called because they knew you could pull that off. They, you were called because they knew you had skills that you had skills more than they did. And they watched you on the set and they knew that you would have it. And your, 
when you say like the, the margin of error, it's huge. But once you know how to do it, it's a piece of cake. It's actually, believe it or not, and I, I love the digital cameras these days, but me and a camera and a magazine and a battery, I could go anywhere in the world and do my thing with a very low impact of having to be reliant on cables uh, power. and batteries and power. I mean, in, the, in, in my day, a GNM battery, a 12, 24 volt battery, 13, 13 amp hour battery can last you all day. Right. You're, little, you're literally almost like running around with a, a camcorder. But yeah, but it's film. Yeah, but film. And, and then plus, if you knew your film and knew your latitudes, it was about actually picking the moment of the day if you didn't have lights to shoot. I worked with many people from Europe when they do commercials. And then when the sun got to about noon or like 11, almost noon, we wouldn't shoot. We wouldn't shoot for like three hours and we'd sit around and they'd drink wine and tell stories and eat bread and, and we'd be like, well, what are we doing? It's like, no, it's not. They go, it is not good to shoot yet. And we would just, you know, <laughs> we, we would say, okay, fine. You know, we'll, we'll just, and then, and then when it would be time, it'd be like, they would kick into action and everything would be great. But you know, it's kind of like the, 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 the impact or the, the footprint, should I say that mm -hmm. you show up with a digital camera these days when you've seen some of these cameras, you know, you got an you got an Alexa with, with forty five thousand cables. Oh God, my! God. It's you a want beast. To look at it and go, you need fifteen there, people just to turn the damn thing on. Is there a camera in there somewhere? Because you just look and say it looks like a alien with spaghetti stuff, and of course you've got little cables that go weird and mm -hmm. little other bugs, electronic bugs, which I know everybody has a computer and you know we like to call them gr gremlins. Gremlins. They're gremlins. Gremlins. gremlins, gremlins bugs. Yes, yes, the, the gremlins. Incompatibilities of things and you go, <laughs> eh, why, why is that not playing right? I'm supposed to be at this frame rate and it's not listening or it's not why is, the, is that for, I don't have the latest firmware so it's not hooking up to oh, the proper always this that, that. Oh my God. It's like, did you update so the firmware? Oh, you're, you're, three, you're three builds back. That's a problem. It's like, ah. So this is, no, a, this is a thing that you that's one of the big pluses you don't have to worry about with shooting Super 16 or shooting film is that film is film. It's been filmed for the last 120 years. It ain't. Yeah. There is no firmware update for it. No, no. And now, that's what I mean, too, is like the conditions of being somewhere very hot and somewhere very cold or switching between them. Electronic devices don't like it. Mm -hmm. And also I had different times where explosions or different types of pyros or different types of percussion of things mm -hmm. would from the explosion, the electromagnetic whatever field of whatever's mm -hmm. happening to jack it, up the it image, yeah. made the camera glitch and all of a sudden stop doing something. Or it's like, what? No, come on. Look, they put they put film cameras up in space on the on the rockets and it didn't have a problem. And you know, I I we we, were, we did the TV show Miami Vice. I was the first time actually I was pulling focus on Miami Vice, and I came out on one night and and the the camera operator looked at me and goes, "You haven't been doing this very long, have you?" <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Look, I." I said, I work at C, you know, Cine Video Tech and blah, blah, blah. I go, yeah, you know it all well, but have you pulled focus on a Lamborghini coming out of nowhere down I-95 at night at 100 miles an hour? I said, nope. <laughs> so he goes, all right, I'm going to, and, and we're on a 300 millimeter. And I go, oh, can't be any more hard, wide open on the 300. So he, he says, okay, I'm going to give you a focus mark here, here, and here, and the rest of it, it's up to you. And it was like, this was now that moment that I felt I can do this. I can do this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're saying, okay, send the car and the, wow, the thing comes. And I went, oh, and I looked at him, I go, did I get it? And he goes, mm, I'm not so sure. Okay. Tell, tell them, do it again. And we do a take two and they didn't want to do take three. And I felt not so good on take two, but you had to rely on your camera operator to say, did I get it or did I buzz it? And he goes, mm -hmm. no, I think that one you got. And we'd see the next day in dailies if it was. Right, right. But the, the way I see people pull focus these days, like, you know, especially people that just have their own camera, they're just looking off the monitor and they're pulling focus off of that. And that was like a taboo. You never looked at the monitor. Well, one, you never had one until later on. Mm -hmm. And the other one was the old fashioned way of running a tape measure and then learning distances and right. then just floating with it and knowing your lenses. So the time that you have to look at a monitor and then react to pulling focus, you're always going to be behind because you're never going to be right on the timing that makes a move and a shot and the whole, the dolly grip and the, and the operator and the, everybody that does this little dance to make a move when they all do it correctly. It's magic. When you don't, you see things that are anomalies. And these days you don't, they're not really learning that way. 
you know, a lot, like a lot of operators, you know, I'm sure the new operators, when they see one of my geared heads, they think it's an alien. They don't know what it is. It's like, how do you do that? I can't tilt and turn. And, and it's like, yeah, you got to do this with your eyes closed. I mean, that you couldn't get as, a, as an operator on any show if you can't operate the wheels. And it would be like, you know, it'd be like that. That's every A camera, at least in my day, you had a geared head. Right, right, right. And they, and they wouldn't give you the geared head on second unit. You get an O'Connor head or something, but you you had to know. I mean, you had wheels. And then if you did anything that was a remote head, crane, something like that, it was wheels. Later on, they came with a joystick. And if you've learned with the wheels, the joystick makes you look it's step, look like a spaz. It's step, it's step and step and step. It's like you, you take steps. You don't just jump. Like you don't just grab a camera and call yourself a uh, a DP. You like you've got to build up to those things. And same things with that, yeah. all the aspects of of film. Now, let me ask you a quick question: What camera would you suggest if you're going to go shoot Super 16 today? Hmm. Well, I've. The 416 that was the last of the Yeri cameras that they made that was film-related was a beautiful combination of all that. Is that the SR3? It's, no, 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 no. It's, the, it's, it's after the SR. They made, a, they made another camera after the, the, the SR. They made a newer version. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's going to be out there mostly, though? The SR. Oh no! You'll find more. You'll find more 16 SRs. I mean, yeah. the 16 SR. They had different models. They had the SR one, two, three, and then they had the high speed versions, and then also the uh, advanced, which was a brighter optical system with a with a a nice uh, more 60 uh, 50 50 50 or 60 40 pellicle split for the color video or integrated video. So that got better. You see, the the video assist kept getting better and better and better. And the camera would be better features like a brighter optical system so you can see it better in low light. And you're, you're actually looking through an image that's flickering because you're seeing the shutter. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, I would, was, SRs, I, so the SRs would probably – because I remember shooting SR3 in college. Yes. Uh, and that's yeah. – SR2s were the workhorses. I mean there's so many SR2s out there and that's a perfectly fine camera. Uh, and then the SR3s as well are a ton of them out there, but but you could but those are kind of the workhorses, right? Like that's kind of yeah. Right. If I was going to say one camera to use, if I had to get rid of all of my film cameras and say what am I going to keep, I'd probably keep an SR3 advanced high speed. Got so it. I'd have the ability to go high speed, low speed, shutter changes, mm-hmm. and it's a brighter system. But you know, it I'm nitpicking because that compared to an SR2. You know, that over the generations, you learned on the models that were there, their strengths and weaknesses. If you could still get past some of the weaknesses and say, you know, the viewfinder doesn't look as crisp and the edges are a little bit soft, but I still know through what I'm getting, it's fine. It's a fine camera. You know what I mean? It's like I, I've... I have almost every film camera that has been made. I mean, I still, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, oh, which which, I, which brings me which brings me. You have to. T- I, I hate to interrupt you. You have to tell the story of <laughs> the Citizen Kane camera. <laughs> really? I just please tell because it was such an awesome story when you told me. Real quick, was, if, was, if you don't want to tell, I'll tell it really quickly. It's, oh, it's, okay, okay, I'll tell it. I'll okay. tell it. My, um, Jimmy Cotner had the camera that that shot Citizen Kane and and was going to donate it to the ASC Museum, and but not till later and gave it to my father. And if for many, many, many years, it sat in his office, which was your right office, above, which is your office. Which, and I've been there many times. I'm like, Hey, that's a pretty cool right. camera. But you never once told me it was the one that shot citizen freaking Kane. And, <laughs> and then there was a, there was a, uh, there's a poster that had Orson Welles on it that, that had, uh, him, you know, like in glass frame, big, big picture of Orson on it. So then it, uh, later year, my father passes away and I take over the company and, you know, time goes on and Jimmy says, you know what, can you, can, can we like set, get that camera and, you know, what, what if you think about donating it to the AC museum? I was like, sure. Okay. Well, you know, I, I haven't moved it even since the day my father died. It's been in the same position for, I don't know, 20 years, something like that. And, uh, so I go to pack it up and try to pack it up. And as I'm there at night by myself and I was like, wow, it's really sad to see this go because I kind of got used to it, seeing it every day. And even when I was a kid, so I started to put it back into the case. And as I'm on the floor, like kneeling down, I see stars, something hits me over the head and I look down and I'm bleeding (laughs) and, and there's glass everywhere. And I'm like, what the hell? And I look up and I go, Orson had come off the wall and hit me straight on the head, <laughs> cut my nose, cut my face, glass everywhere, cut my hand. And I said, 
dude, are you mad that I'm getting rid of this? Or did I just disrupt some little pod of energy that decided to go ah, and spaz out and, you know, had that happen? And That's I, 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 I cleaned up my blood. And then, of course, I told my staff the next day, look what happened here. But I think if you wanted to go see it, it's over at ASC right now. That's that's <laughs> super fun. Man. And I still had the poster. I never put glass in it again because I don't want him to hit me again. Of, fair enough. Fair enough. Maybe he was mad. I don't know. Orson rolled over and got pissed. So what? Um, if you had one piece of advice you can give any filmmaker starting out in the business, what would would it be? You gotta love what you do, and you gotta have passion for it, and you gotta wanna you wanna up your your game, up your. I mean, everybody's gonna do something, but do it in a unique way that is inherent to you and then make it just grow as you get more time in the seat and the saddle your experience will grow and too many times i see that a lot of the younger generation they want it fast and cheap but then it mostly isn't good and it and it and it, it comes off as being arrogant for the masters that have spent their life trying to learn something and try to do it like you like like somebody who doesn't go to college and somebody who does and they want to tell them you know my way is the best way it's like yeah I don't want to hear that it's like you that you have to put in your time one way or another and to give a little respect to where it's calmed and out because it's gotten so easy from the backs of people that had did it way before you. And we're, mm-hmm. we're always experimenting, Standard. always pushing the, the envelopes and nobody knows everything. Like I always say, I go out there and a lot of times I work on jobs and nothing really surprises me. And then there's other times that like, Hey, I learned something even today. And that's that I love because if you keep learning, you don't become a jaded dinosaur. And at least you can you can keep moving forward. Well, it's funny too because anytime we've worked together, a lot I know you've learned a few things from me on post. You're like, oh, so that's oh, what you could do in post. Yeah, <laughs> and I've learned no. and, and I've learned a ton from you on set without question. Well, if if I if there, the things that you could learn in post, then even to this day, what you can learn in post gives you that confidence when you're on set is is saying, do I need to spend 15 minutes flagging off that light, or can yep. I just wipe it away? And if I can wipe it away, then I'm not going to worry about it. Or if that, or if I'm going to say, is that going to really be dark, or is that going to be? Well, I know I'm going to crush it down a stop and a half. So, and I know it's going to be fine because I I did it before with so and so. So you your confidence level is super good with that moment because you 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 know what you can get away with. There's certain things you can't get. If it's out of focus, there's no fix it in post. (laughs) Well, uh, hey, I'm I'm going to disagree with you slightly. Because really? if it's really? so soft, if, you, if, if you, it's soft, if, you don't hit if focus it's and they're soft, soft, you, you can if make it it's better. soft, you can fix it. If it's soft, because um, and, you'll have to show me that because I, I well because I because specifically because I learned this on Meg. I've learned so much shooting Meg, <laughs> being the photographer of Meg. I, I refuse to call myself a, a cinematographer, a director of photography, but uh, since I photographed it. Uh, I learned a ton. And, you know, since it was basically only three people on the crew uh, (laughs) uh, and I I was running one of the cameras, there was no assistant camera. You were your own assistant camera. So sometimes, you know, things happen. You know, actors move and things got a little soft. So I actually took it in DaVinci and uh, there is a sharpen tool, which I was never a big fan of because it never really looked right. But if you throw a sharpen and then you throw another thing on it and then you do clean this up here and you do this there – all of a sudden, you're like, holy crap, it's in focus. <laughs> but it has to be you're, soft. It can't be out of focus. It, can't, it has to be soft. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. It has to, I mean, like if it's well, completely out of focus, you're, it, you're done. But if you're slightly soft where you can actually see it soft, I look at their eyes and their eyes are a little soft. I just go uh-huh. – I just tweak it. Okay. I just that, little that, tweak That's it a tweak. But, but I, what I'm saying oh, is – Out of focus is out of focus. I mean there's nothing let, – Let's say do. that I, I was doing a, a food thing uh, last month and you know, you're at 300 frames a second – at uh, a five six with a twenty five millimeter lens of macro with mm-hmm. food falling, when it's not sharp. No, 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 no. That's a whole other. It's world. soft for a long time as you're watching it at twenty four. It's like going, oh my god. But you please. might. I, I would still like give it if you gave me that footage. I could see what I could do. It's believe me. You, I, see, I, you're I, a magic I, man. I can't I know. Believe, you can pull. You can pull I, things that I, I don't even wait, know about. You got I that can't whole wait little... for you to see. I can't wait for you to see, man, because I want you to see it and just go, oh, okay. Because I had a couple of my buddies who are ASC cinematographers watch it, and they're like, it looks good. He goes, I mean, hire us next time, obviously, but it doesn't look. I mean, it looks fine. You know, it's not. Well, like, but if you hire, look, the way you pulled this off, you wore what ten hats, 
and that 50 you kept to 20 hats all, at least. <laughs> okay. 20 hats, 50 hats. Yeah. You still, you still had the, the well with all to keep it intimate. Have to. The more, the more people that you bring in, like I've worked on jobs that are like 500 people, you well, know, sure, it's sure. insane. You're like, yeah. you're, you're breaking intervals of lunch of 200 people at a time. Yeah. And it's just, it's a, it's an army, it's a city and it doesn't have the same intimacy as if it's just you and three people, you can get more, Mm -hmm. more performance out. You also can, if you're not, if you're not a a tyrant, you can actually get people to love you and follow you into that scary place and trust you as a director to release their, their, their best uh, soft emotional side to, Mm -hmm. to capture on, on frames. And you can do that. I mean, that, that not having an army of people sometimes works for you. It, it makes you a little bit tired and you need a week to recover, yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't say do it on every job, but I do think that there is something good about doing that, especially if you're taking like fashion stuff, the more people, and let's say somebody's half naked and they're dancing around and doing something like that. You put in a whole army there, it makes them feel uncomfortable. You, you have like two people and just say, look, trust me, I'm going to make you look good. And you know, you have the choice of I don't know, how to how far to go, and you get a better performance. I think. Oh well, my 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 lead actress Jill, she's like I, I'm never shooting anything without you again because you made me look amazing. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, yeah. But mind you, I did color the hell out of it. But anyway, we won't get on that. Uh, so re- real quick, my friend, um, the last two questions I always ask all of my guests are the toughest ones. So prepare yourself. Oh boy. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in life or in the film industry? Ah, the lesson that I had to learn. Hmm. You don't know everything. (laughs) Even though you might feel it, you don't know it. And some of the choices that you make many years later can come back to reward you or come back to haunt you. Mm -hmm. That's very, very true. I I think that... uh, If I try to keep thinking that, look, I'm lucky to have a job where we're doing make believe, we're really selling mirrors to the land of the blind. We're doing we're doing advertising of products that are better looking than the actual product itself. Mm-hmm. We're getting consumerism to buy things or go and and follow directors because they emotionally get brought onto a to a place that they love their films and you're you're doing it you're giving somebody in the in the way this world can be so ugly and horrible and distressful you can have a moment of two hours to watch a movie and feel good about yourself so you can touch people you know unilaterally whether whatever nationality you are through this medium Mm-hmm. And that it's not brain surgery, so it should be something that you enjoy doing, and it should be something that you don't beat into people like you're building a pyramid. That you that you do it in a creative way, and then you're proud of it, and you might actually feel good that you were there. Like those magical moments that changes people's careers, that you can say and look next to the person and say, "I was there with you that night." I was I was a part of that, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I I I experienced that moment, and I knew this was going to be a turning point, and that's that's a neat thing because people to do what they love that pays their bills and also fulfills their spirit, it's tough to find that calling, and if this is going to be the one, which I'm not saying it is, because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a lot of sucky parts about it completely that I I you know I when I got fired off that job I didn't leave my my apartment for two weeks thinking I just never want to be in public again because I was so yeah, yeah, yeah. hurt by it. But you know, it, it has some terrible lows. And then it, and then if you can sort of ride that out and remember your place that you don't know everything and there's somebody that's going to know or do something a little bit better, embrace it and just kind of be open to it and receptive to it. And, and learn, I think, and learn, I think really it's about learning whether I'm 50 or 20 as long as I keep learning, it keeps me excited. If it's, if it's, if I don't want to learn and it becomes boring, I got to do something else. Now, what are your three favorite films of all time? Blade Runner. Excellent. Uh, Domino. I love Domino. That's a, that's the first time it's been on the show. Good. That's a good, that's a oh, good really? movie. Yeah. No one else has called Domino out. That's a Tony Scott uh, film. I mean, so <laughs> brilliantly shot. It's brilliant. Well, the ending in that is, is you're so committed to that kind of a style that 
if no, no, you no, got no, the no. whole team backing you, you get to it's Tony stumble Scott, upon man. greatness it's in Tony. that crazy. It's Tony Connecticut. Scott. Tony Scott. I mean, he he revolutionized the action movie. There's no question about it. Well, actually, and then and of course they said Blade Runner, so that's that's that's, that's Ridley. Another- that's really that's really who also revolutionized and whoever, whoever's listening to this a podcast right now and has not seen Blade Runner you need to stop listening right now and go stream it rent it buy it whatever you won't be sorry and what's the, and what's your third one sir and it still holds up I, I I'm not oh, so today, today I'm not so sure up. about Blade Runner two that I heard is a hey, thing we'll see we'll see uh, we'll, we'll see so I, we'll see I'm I, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep open. Yeah, uh, look, look, look. I mean, and here's going to be one that you probably, I mean, look, I could go on by telling you films like Fellini's Eight and a Half sure, and sure, Go sure, Back sure, sure, to sure, Seven sure. Samurai and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and all these type of things. So but I would say one? something that I, could, that I could go and grab to would that I can see over and over again because, I don't know, it seemed like it's more old school mm-hmm, mm-hmm. would probably be Excalibur. Oh wow! I, yeah, I, I loved Excalibur when because I saw I, it. I like Borman's. I like I like the way it it looked. I mean, you didn't have all the visual and special effects. You had to do them practically. Mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. had more of a story about King Arthur. It had real actors, even though they did every scene yelling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. But I don't know. I could I could watch it over and over again. Or Dune, for instance, that's another mm-hmm, one I, mm-hmm. I I love. Just the way they because I mean, there's these days. Give me something that happened recently. A movie line that you can remember. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember anything right now. Exactly, but you can remember movie lines from Breakfast Club. You can remember movie lines from from Arnold's movies. You can remember movie uh, lines of from course, of course. from from Talladega Nights or certain things that are like you know like they from, just stick from, with you. They just stick with they you. They stick with you. Ghostbusters, the original. You have you know. There's so many when a line or something in a movie that sticks with you, even like Blade Runner, not an easy thing to meet your maker. You know, it's kind of like mm-hmm. you know this. These are I don't find that commonly now with certain things you say a line and i get people looking at me think i'm just talking to myself like a crazy man but it really has a reference and a homage to a certain film now where can uh people find you online sir uh let's say you can check me on on facebook uh under sydney video tech or egon stefan jr um instagram uh, Snapchat, uh, and your LinkedIn. website, your website's actually website Cine, Cine w- Tech. Yeah. com. We're going to update that. Uh, it's, it needs a, uh, a new facelift, but it's still the same people. We're still the, we're still the only rental house. One of the very, very few that are still around from the original family from 1968. So In the Miami. name and the people I'm the second generation and hopefully at some point one of my kids wants to do this too and I can I can have them uh take over my little part. But we've been trying to be a stable place in Miami, Florida for a very long time. And when you look at the whole industry in itself, many companies were bought and sold and still kept the same name, but not have the same people that are back and behind it. And I'm still one of the very few independently owned that still maintained like it was in the old days, we have lights that are from 40 years old that still mm. work. And we have lenses yeah. and cameras from way back, even hand crank cameras that some or movieolas that people don't even know how to thread up, or you know some things that I'm saying. This today's technology, you can still use older lenses on newer cameras, and you can still use older lights on on newer scenes. It does a light is a light. It just how how and they a lens is, and a lens is a lens, right? So you know it's it's one of those things that I. I feel more than just that I'm a cameraman or that I'm a teacher or a mentor for a lot of people. It's like I also feel obligated that I'm I'm like a storehouse of knowledge for, you know, this medium and I, I'm always wanting to pass it on to anybody else and still try to offer the tools to the filmmakers that I was offered. Man, thank you so much, uh, Egon, for being on the show and thank you for being a part of uh our um our little uh, course that we put together for 16 millimeter, super 16 millimeter. And then we have a couple other courses coming up, uh, a lens masterclass, which literally Egon opened up the vault and we looked at mm-hmm. every freaking lens on the planet and shot with it. And it's obscene. Uh, and we also have another one with filters, just the magic of what filters can do as well coming up uh, in the next few months. But right now we're going to, we're releasing uh, the super 16 uh, definitive 
Super 16 Masterclass. Uh, and I will give you all that information in the show notes, guys. But Egon, brother, thank you. As hey, always, Alex, man. the best, man. You know, I've always said that you're you're one of a kind, and I'm so happy to be your friend and so happy to be a part of this. And you've you've helped me over all the years, and I think this is a uh, fantastic thing you're doing. And keep it going, buddy. Thank you, brother. Thanks for being on the show. And I hope you guys enjoyed that episode with uh, with Egon and our a little talk. And, uh, you know, again, film is not dead, guys. It's not. As much as people like to say it's completely gone, it's quietly working in the background. And things that you thought that are not being shot on film are being shot on film. So don't think that you can't shoot film because it's way, way too expensive or way out of your, you know, price le- you know, league or that you need, you know, insane amounts of people to do it. You know, it is more complicated than grabbing your iPhone and shooting, but the results will be worth the extra time and money that you will need to shoot it, but it's still very affordable considering when you start doing the math. So as promised, guys, if you guys want to take this course, which will be growing, I'm going to be adding a few more things to it uh, in the coming months. So just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash super 16. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash super 16. And not the word, the number. So the word super and the number 16. So IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Super 16, and I'm going to be giving you 50 bucks off the cost of the course. This is a really special course, guys. It's a it's a long course. It has a lot of information on it. If you're serious about shooting Super 16 or shooting film or interested in that knowledge, this is definitely the course for you. And also included in the course are a ton of downloadable forms, reports, things like that that you can't get anywhere else. Uh, and that's included in the course. So you can download all this stuff and get things ready. Film reports, shot lists, all this kind of stuff that you will need to deal with film labs and so on. So that's all included in the course as well. Uh, and we'll be adding more stuff to it in the coming weeks. There's a lens masterclass that we're working on. That uh, there's we, we put the Super 16 one in the course. And it's one of the free lessons that we put up on YouTube. And they'll be in the show notes. But we're also creating a lens masterclass, which literally, and I'm not joking you, takes every single lens known to man, and we put it up on a on a on a on a red, and we shoot it, and we show you what the differences are, and we explain it, and where they came from, and how to use them, and what kind of mounts they are. It's an insane course, uh, and we're going to be including parts of that in this course, but also be adding that as another full masterclass coming in the next few months as soon as I have a moment to breathe to put it all together. So thank you again as always, guys. And please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave us an honest review on the show. It really helps us out a lot. And don't forget, this is Meg.com and check out the trailer for my latest and first feature film, This Is Meg. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about it. Drop me a line, drop me an email, uh, drop me a message on Facebook or on Twitter and uh, or post it on Facebook and just let me know what you guys think. I'm really, really excited about it. I'm so happy that I was able to do it. And there is more stuff coming on Indie Film Syndicate. Uh, so don't forget also, guys, to head over to IndieFilmSyndicate.com and join the, the gang uh, of learning all the stuff that we have in Indie Film Syndicate. And I will be adding new courses this month to the Indie Film Syndicate. Uh, or November, excuse me. We've already added for October. But we will be adding new courses in November as well as new uh, lessons in the Independent Filmmaking Masterclass, which helps you go through the entire process I went through creating This Is Meg on a, let's say, under $25 million budget. (laughs) So, guys, thank you again so much. Keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 